Our theme for this study is Words That Lead to Jesus, and the idea is that we're looking at words from the Bible, some of which have become very familiar words to us in our you know, church vocabulary, but to look at them in the context of their biblical origins, which is very important um, because the context and the meaning of the words helps us to um, apply them to our lives and understand better uh, what the scriptures are telling us. And I think we gain a lot from looking at the meaning and the context of these words. Um, You know, there's so many times, I think, where people of faith, people in the church even, um, can, it's easy for us to kind of take words, familiar words, and twist them, pervert them to kind of fit what we want them to say, or what our own agendas are, or... um, you know, that kind of thing. And so this kind of helps us to restore a a biblical and gospel-centered vocabulary to the church. So we don't use these words as clubs or weapons, but rather as life-giving vehicles uh, that they are intended to be. So we've been looking through a few of these words, and today we are going to look at the word shalom, which is a Hebrew word, and it means peace. This is one of these words um, that you've probably heard of before. Um, if you've come to the Passover dinner uh, here at church, you know, we always sing, we begin the Passover dinner with shalom, and we sing that little song, shalom, my friend, shalom, my friend. Um, it also reminds me of Vacation Bible School, was talking about looking back at the way things were, you know, the Bible schools we had where we'd always sing shalom together on those uh, biblical marketplace studies. Um, so it's a word that does have found its way into um, in its original uh, form. It means peace, and we're going to take a look at what the word shalom means in the Hebrew text in the Old Testament and um, how that can help us to expand the meaning of it uh, for us today. So we'll look at a few of these things uh, before we watch the little video. So first of all, shalom in the Hebrew text in biblical usage is the daily language of well-being. So maybe you have heard that the word shalom as a greeting is similar to aloha. It can mean hello, it can mean goodbye, it can mean how are you. It can mean all of those greetings. We have lots of different greetings. Hey, what's up? You know, things like that. Uh, But shalom is a greeting that um, is expansive and it can mean lots of different things. But it's a word that found its way into the daily language and usage of God's people as a way to um, check on well-being. So, for example, a greeting would be, Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you, to which the response would be, Aleichem Shalom. And also, with you. (laughs) Does that sound familiar? That's kind of been translated through the ages into the church, even into our liturgy. And what I like about this, um, instead of, you know, just saying hi or how are you, is that uh, this shalom, this peace that we're going to try to unpackage and discover more about, is not some elusive thing, not something we have to reach up into the heavens for or go into, you know, transcendental meditation for, anything like that. But it is something that is realized in daily life amidst all the challenges of family and vocation and just things going around us, this shalom is inserted into our daily life, the sense of well-being and balance. Um, And that, I think, is very important for us to remember. It is not something that we have to get into a spiritual trance to experience, but it is something that is part of our daily life when it is given and received and acknowledged. Uh, This greeting of shalom you might remember from the Easter stories, was repeated by Jesus when he appeared to his disciples. He said, peace be with you. A number of our Easter stories, you know, have Jesus saying that, peace be with you, shalom aleichem. And um, uh, it is repeated by us in worship. We kind of have a a pause, you know, on our sharing of the peace, but um, that 
idea of sharing this peace, the shalom of God in worship, is something that is uh, from our Hebrew ancestors. Um, here's an example of using shalom as a way to check on the well-being of someone. Uh, remember Joseph and his brothers. Uh, Joseph, you know, was, was sold into slavery. As in, in Egypt, he gets reunited with his brothers, and in, he inquires of them of, about the shalom of their father. How is, you know, my, our father's shalom? What, how is his well-being? Is he well? Um, and, and this kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I, I really like this idea of it being part of daily language and daily life. Um, it's something that we can hold on to, even if the world around us, as it kind of is right now, seems to be very much falling apart or confusing or even fearful. Shalom is something that we can receive and share in the regular rhythm of daily life. All right. So, um, we learn from the usage in the Old Testament that shalom is the absence of something, but it is also the presence of something. I think when we think of peace, like, I just want peace and quiet, what does that mean? I want no distractions, I don't want any noise, I don't want anything around me, I just want silence. Um, and that's maybe a part of peace, and even part of shalom, but there's more to it. It is also the presence of of something. So shalom might be used as an absence of war and conflict, but it also refers to the presence of wholeness and restoration. It in, implies that there is a new restored relationship, a new perspective. And so yes, absence of conflict and war, but also the presence of restoration and balance and well-being. All right. So, shalom means to be complete and whole. Um, the world is fragmented. Not just now, it always seems to be. Um, there's lots of divisions in the world, right? So many things that divide people. Our own lives are fragmented. Um, and so, we need the shalom in our world. We need it also in our own lives. Um, the video will use this analogy of uh, shalom being like a wall. And when a brick is missing, it is not as strong. And it, there is something missing. Um, you know that feeling when everything is okay in life except this one thing. And you can't really embrace peace or that feeling of everything is okay and balance and well-being because there's this one thing that isn't quite right. And so the restoration of shalom is like putting that piece back in place in the wall um, so that it creates a balance and, and a, a strong thing. Um, so shalom in the Old Testament scriptures is something that sets everything right. It makes, fills in all the pieces. And when we think about it a little bit beyond that, when we think about our world or our community or our relationships, it's shalom that makes us one. It is the absence of conflict between you and me, or between one community and another, but it is also the presence of restoration, of connectedness to each other. Having shalom doesn't mean that we don't have wounds, or we don't have any brokenness, or that everything is perfect, because that brokenness and those injuries develop compassion that lead to more connectedness, more shalom. Um, it also doesn't mean that Everything and everyone is the same, okay? Part of the beautiful reality of being connected is that there is diversity and, a comp and lots of complex moving parts. But when there is shalom, there is a state of connectedness and everything moving together. Okay, um, remember when we looked at the word ahava, the word for love, and talked about how most all words, really, in the Hebrew language, this is a Hebrew word, are made up of three consonants, sometimes two. And you can make any form of the word just based on those three consonants by how you add little vowels and little things to it. So shalom is both a noun and it can be a verb. So shalom is a gift that is given as a noun, but is also a verb. You shalom something, you make things right, and you restore things. Um, 
And to do that is a lot of work, which leads us to the final thing, kind of the whole point of it, is that Jesus is our shalom. Uh, the New Testament identifies Jesus as our peace. He did the work to restore, right, the relationship between us and God and between us and each other. He has made, in Christ, God has made, has fashioned a new humanity um, where there are no divisions. Um, the divisions between me and you, between us and the other, whatever it is, between this community and that community, between vulnerable and privileged, between powerful and powerless, um, there is an integration of all things in Christ. Um, the New Testament talks about Christ being the head and everything is restored under his gentle, gracious rule. The things that are broken, things that have been separated, are brought together by Christ, who is our shalom. And we'll talk about that a little bit after the video. Now we have a little technical challenge with the video because of, we don't have our <clears throat> amplifier. So I'm going to attempt to play the video on the screen and also play the sound. So just give me one second and be patient if, they're, if it's a little bit off, but I'll do my best. The word peace is common in most languages. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. 
And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Okay. Um, they talk so fast, don't they? Um, you can rewatch the video. I have you know, watched it several times to prepare. And the videos just by themselves are on the website. So <clears throat> I encourage you to watch it again just to kind of get a fuller understanding of it. Um, but let's um, take what we heard and um, see if we can discuss a little bit. Um, and so we have a couple of questions to get us started. First of all, <clears throat> what was new for you in the presentation or video? What new discovery did you make about peace in the world and in your life? And let's start with that. So, anybody? So the thought here is that um, the new discovery is expanding the idea of peace, not just a kind of a, a you know, a, a, a greeting used for hello and goodbye, but actually the idea of harmony um, and connectedness, you know, is, is a new discovery for this. I think that's super important. Anybody else? Something new from the presentation? We're supposed to create sort of a shalom utopia. Okay. So the old... Yeah. So the yeah, God's plan for them in the Old Testament was that the, the kings of Israel and kings of Judah were to work with others and to create this kind of peace. Um, but as the video pointed out, often failed to do that. But that was their call to do it. Anybody else? Sue. Um, yeah. So a new discovery here is shalom not just being a noun, a thing, but actually a verb to make peace, to the work that Jesus did and the work that he calls us to do, right? Anybody else? So the idea here is um, not just the absence of conflict, but actually that there is the presence of something. Something, how did you say it? There's a completeness. And a, yeah. So peace being, shalom being um, that wholeness and completeness, not just the absence of actively con being in conflict, but making something new in the relationship. Anybody else? Okay, yes, so question two. Uh, so it's not just the absence of conflict, but also the presence of connection and completion. So who and what do we need in order to experience this connection and sense of completion in our lives today? How does that, how do we experience it? How do we observe it? Um, how do we help create it? Anybody? Okay. 
Yeah. So John is making a reference to the sermon, which is always nice. Um, but the idea of, of um, listening to the gospel, hearing the good news, putting myself... I always think of it like putting ourselves where, where it's hitting us, you know, is, is a good way to think about where we are hearing good news because it always does something to us, right? It makes us less judgmental. It helps us to let go of things. And I think that, for me, is a big part of it. Is uh, It has to involve letting something go. It has to involve putting, letting go of pride or something. When you think just on a basic term of human relationships, when there's a conflict, you know, between you and someone, it's not going to move forward or get resolved or restored until the parties put down their weapons or put down their uh, defenses or their control or something like that. And so maybe that's part of it in our daily lives is learning to put these things down, letting go of, of the rights that we have. I just often think that when the church is always is, and this is maybe a little bit of a side note, but I'm thinking of it right now, when the church is in a position of defending its rights, I, that's, I think, should be a red flag for us. When we are defending our own rights instead of the rights of others, the fatherless and the widow, you know, like we have talked about before, or those who are oppressed or in bondage, that's the focus. When we're fighting for ourselves, that's not leading to shalom, I don't think. It's not where we should be. Anybody else have something? Barb. What do you think? So the question Barb is raising is, can you experience true shalom or true peace without Christ? I think that's a very good question. I have some thoughts about it. What do you, th you think, Barb? Yes. Yeah. Yep, okay. So we have two different ideas of peace. You know, when we often think about peace in the worldly vocabulary, we're thinking of just everybody's kind of in their own corner and everything's quiet and there's no conflict. But shalom is ask, calling us to something more, the presence of restoration. Any other thoughts of this? Can shalom be experienced in the world in relationships without an acknowledgement of Christ? I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Doug? I'm sorry, say it again. Oh. Possibly. I think the church can restore its use, you know, because we have this context and meaning. Uh, Doug is suggesting, you know, restoring the word shalom in, into English as a better word than just peace. I had this idea about, um, you know, what Jesus did. I don't... I think it's clear that Jesus did not do what he did, namely giving his life on the cross in order to receive accolades or to receive people acknowledging that and that kind of thing. He did it to make something new. Whether we acknowledge it or not, he's there to make us free, to create this peace. So the, could a non-Christian learn from Jesus' way, you know, and say, Jesus did this all without any self-interest. He laid it all down. Even though he had the prerogatives of God himself, he laid this down in order to bring people together. That, even without a baptized Christian, you know, acknowledgement of it, does something, right? I mean, I think it, it does show us a way, another way. Um, John? Okay, so definitely without question, I think we can agree that there is a unique deliverance of shalom through Christ, for sure. Um, but does it have a trickle-down or ripple effect, or does it echo in our world because of what Jesus did? Has he carved out a way um, that even people from the outside look in and say, you know, 
that was something different than we than any leader on earth has ever done was to lay it down to restore anyway it does open up another way i think for us to understand things what do the rest of you think okay um, the next section refers us to this uh, story in the gospel. I'm just going to read it for you, and then um, we'll have a little discussion about this. Uh, from Luke 8. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then there came a man named Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well, and here it comes. Go in peace. So we see here in this story how this woman found shalom not just in the midst of a, a long illness, but in the literal midst of this chaotic crowd where people were all pressing in on Jesus. Um, and as soon as she touched Jesus, she was made physically whole. And Jesus recognized her faith and, and this healing that took place and said, go in peace. Or in other words, continue to live in this whole, restored, healed condition. And so that's what she needed, physical restoration and wholeness. But it can affect other parts of our being as well, right? So where there's fragmentation in any part of our being, where there's an unhealed wound, um, there is a place where shalom needs to be restored. So, here we go. So where do you need shalom to be restored in body, mind, or spirit? Um, and as we consider how Jesus responded to this woman in need, I think we can ask ourselves these questions. So when you think about your need for shalom, or maybe a, a less personal, indirect way to think about it is to think about how you observe it in others. Do you think that this is for those you love, for those that you know about, or for you yourself? Is it mostly physical? Or is it spiritual, or emotional, or relational, or vocational? I was trying to think of as many different ways that we might need it as possible. Maybe you can think of another way. Franklin. <laughs> All of those. Okay. Anybody else? And one... Certainly a wound in one or a, or a missing part in one certainly affects all the others, it seems, right? So, Steve's saying that... Um, during this time where we're all, during the pandemic, we are have fewer connections, fewer interactions with each other. That seems to really um, be a great need for many of us, and it does impact other parts of, of people's lives. We hear about how this has really led to lots of other detrimental things in, in people's lives, to have this lack of connection and relation. Franklin? Yes, if you think about the way we handled this in the past seven months, that woman had to live for 12 years yeah. because, she, because she was unclean, so it would affect everything. Okay, so Franklin's pointing out that the woman had this for 12 years of being un considered unclean, not able to probably have connections in the community, in the synagogue, and so forth. And so that was very difficult for her, yeah. Anybody else on individual needs for this shalom? The next question follows that up with uh, asking us to consider our community. Where does shalom need to be restored in the community? And we could maybe go back to those same things, physical, spiritual, emotional, 
relational, what in our community, you know, in whatever way, narrow definition of that or a broader definition, where do you think uh, that needs to be restored? Probably spiritual, relational, and vocational because if it had an open tub, then the tub, then unfortunately, is all just fault. Okay. So, Frank is suggesting a, 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 a place for sh that shelters battered women is always seems to have no vacancy. And there's lots of Oh, and, the car, and there was a carjacking. Okay, so those refer to physical needs, you know, where wholeness needs to be restored. Yeah. Right. So leading to other emotional things as well and deficits like that. Okay. Anybody else? We were talking the other day about how, I, I think it's very interesting right now, and I'm not sure how this fits in, but I think people that have very different perspectives or views on things happening in our world can identify the same problems, even, even though they might you know, attribute those problems to completely different things. There's kind of an agreement on what is lacking, right? Um, and so it seems to me that you know, part of our community, our larger community wholeness is, is needing understanding and being heard. And I think when people do not feel heard or understood, this leads to a lot of, um, a lot of things that are more systemic and societal um, when there's part of a community that feels forgotten or feels unheard, right? I think that's, we could agree on that. Anybody else? We are almost out of time. And um, the next part encourages us to read this Ephesians passage. But I'm going to draw your attention to uh, this, verse 14. He, Christ, is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. So Paul is here talking about Jews and Gentiles and his point is that through Christ, these two groups have been brought together into one family, into the church, um, so that the hostility that once made it impossible for these groups uh, to get along and to be in community with each other was put to death on the cross. And um, so the final questions here ask us to imagine what it's like to be far away from God, to be disconnected from the community of, of faith. Jesus provided this way to bring us close to God. And that is what creates shalom and brings us peace. So how does it feel? What is it like to be at peace with God through Christ, would you say? I think for me, it feels very much like this feels very much like gathering together uh, in worship. It feels very much like relationships with each other um, and where we have support and encouragement, um, you know, where we are in a safe and welcome place. I think it, it helps to begin to put those missing pieces back. It does that for me anyway. These kinds of relationships, this focus on Christ and the good news begins to do that for us. I think when we are alone, when we are apart from it, it, it tends to create more brokenness, more wounds. But coming together, this is where Christ is present. This is where that peace is shared and realized and given and, um, through the good news, as you said earlier, Don. You know, getting ourselves in line of the good news so that it can t continue to work on us. So anybody else have an idea about that? Okay, well, thank you for coming. We went as, as long as I said we were going to go. So thank you for watching, if you're watching online or at another time. Uh, we will continue our study two weeks from today. 
And I don't remember what the topic is, but I will make sure to get the word out uh, about that. So, and again, the videos are on the website. So if you want to go there, if you go on the front page, just go down to the Bible study part um, and just click on there and all the videos are on there and the study questions um, and also videos of our, our time and our discussion today. So thanks everybody. Have a great day.